Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing cyclic AMP signaling. Okay, right, so in this video we want to discuss the concept of a cyclic AMP signaling microdomain, okay, which is also called a cyclic AMP signaling compartment. Okay, now the concept of a, a cyclic AMP signaling microdomain or a cyclic AMP signaling compartment is still controversial, but it is gaining favour. It's becoming the favourite way of explaining a problem with the classical view of how cyclic AMP signaling works. Okay, so let me firstly just show you the classical view of how cyclic AMP signaling occurs, okay? And then I'll show you what the problem with that uh, view is. So basically the classical view, okay, was that cyclic AMP signals were global. Okay, so the classical view was that cyclic AMP signaling was a global signal. Now what do I mean by that? Well, if we have our cell here, Let's imagine that we stimulate some uh, G protein coupled receptor that's GS coupled on the surface of our cell, okay? And this will obviously activate the GS cascade and then activate it in our cyclase enzymes. The idea was that cyclic AMP would go up everywhere in the cytoplasm of the cell, okay? So the cyclic AMP signal was not localized at all, okay? It was a global signal. And that was supported by the fact that cyclic AMP is very diffusible, okay? It spreads, it's a very small molecule and it can diffuse, okay? So it was thought that cyclic AMP would go up everywhere in the cytoplasm of the cell and that was the global signal, basically. It was covering the entire cytoplasm of the cell. Okay, now, there is a problem with that, okay? And it comes quite simply from cardiomyocytes, okay? so. Basically, if we now let our cell be a cardiomyocyte, and I'll draw a separate picture for this, cardiomyocytes have uh, two different types of receptors on their surface, which both couple to GS uh, heterotrimeric G proteins. They probably have far more than two, but I'm just going to give you two as an example. Okay, so one of these receptors is the beta-1 adrenergic receptor. Okay, and the other is the EP4 receptor. So these are my two examples of receptors that are on the surface of cardiomyocytes. And I'm now talking about a normal cardiomyocyte rather than a sinoatrial node uh, cardiomyocyte. Okay, uh, so let's say it's a cardiomyocyte that's capable of contraction. Okay, so maybe I took it from the ventricle. Okay, or one of the ventricles rather. So basically, if you stimulate the beta-1 adrenergic receptor with adrenaline, Okay, you'll get a cyclic AMP signal being generated, and what this results in is the cardiomyocyte contracting now with increased force. Okay, so the activation of the beta 1 adrenergic receptor causes contractility to go up. Okay, the EP4 receptor is a receptor for prostaglandin E2. Okay, PGE2, so this stands for prostaglandin E2. E2, okay, so the EP4 is for prostaglandin E2, and it's the type 4 receptor for prostaglandin E2. Okay, now, when you activate the EP4 receptor, it activates the exact same cascade. It activates the GS cascade, it activates the denial cyclases, you get cyclic AMP being produced, but you do not, repeat, you do not get an increase in contractility. Okay, that's only provoked by the beta-1 adrenergic receptor. Okay, so, why is the question? If you use the classical view of how cyclic AMP signaling works, that cyclic AMP glows up in the entire cytoplasm of the cell, okay, then the effect of stimulating the beta-1 adrenergic receptor surely should not be any different from stimulating EP4 receptors. This theory cannot account for this, basically, okay? And this is fundamentally where the idea of microdomains comes from. The fact that these different receptors, which both activate the same cascade, can cause very different effects, that is what we are trying now to explain, okay? Why is this the case, okay? And this gives rise to the concept of microdomains. So the concept of microdomains is really a concept a theoretical concept that is gradually gaining more and more proof
that explains, that offers an explanation as to how this can actually uh, be achieved, how this specificity of action can actually be achieved, why the different receptors on the same cell which activate the same intracellular cascade cause such different effects in that cell. Okay, right. So, to be able to discuss microdomains plausibly, what I need to firstly discuss is uh, something known as A-kinase anchoring proteins. So we're going to come back to this problem, we're going to throw it aside for one moment, we're going to discuss A-caps now, and then we will use A-caps to, to develop the concept of a microdomain, and then we'll come back to the solution to this problem, basically, or the hypothetical solution to this problem, because as I say, it's not set in stone, the concept of microdomains. Most rational people agree that it probably is the case, okay, uh, but it isn't a hard, solid fact yet. Okay, right, so let's now discuss A-kinase anchoring proteins, okay, uh, which for short are abbreviated as A-caps, so this stands for A-kinase, which is another name for protein kinase A, it's one of the names that I didn't give you, uh, protein kinase A, cyclic AMP dependent protein kinase, or A-kinase, they all mean the same thing, okay, and then anchoring proteins. Okay, so basically these are proteins which are capable of binding to protein kinase A tetramers in the inactive state. Okay, so there are a growing number of these in humans. Okay, I think the number stands at now over 50 A caps that we have found in humans. Okay, so let me draw you now a very basic picture of the structure of an A kinase anchoring protein. So A kinase anchoring proteins can be divided broadly into just two domains, okay? So I'll split it like so, okay? One of these domains is what's known as the targeting domain, and I'll colour this domain in, in green here. Okay, so this domain is the targeting domain, and basically this binds to uh, other proteins uh, in, of the cell. Alternatively, it might bind to lipid membranes or might have lipid moieties attached onto it to anchor it in other membranes. The basic principle here is that this targeting domain is involved in determining where the A kinase anchoring protein is actually located within the cell. Okay, so this is the targeting domain in green. Okay, and then here, this other domain is what's known as the protein kinase A, or the PKA uh, binding domain. Okay, and I'll cover the protein kinase A binding domain in, in blue. And this domain is where, obviously, the A kinase anchoring protein is going to bind to protein kinase A. Okay, so basically the idea is that these A caps are scaffold proteins. They localize in some subcellular location and then they bind protein kinase A um, tetramers in the inactive form. Now remember, I told you long ago when we were studying protein kinase uh, A inactive tetramers that there were these two different types type 1 protein kinase A uh, enzymes. Okay, and then there were also type 2 protein kinase A enzymes. And remember the difference between type 1 and type 2 protein kinase A enzymes lay in the regulatory subunits used to produce the regulatory subunit dimer. Okay, so if you used type 1 regulatory subunits to produce the regulatory dimer, you've got a type 1 protein kinase A enzyme. If you used type 2 regulatory subunits to produce the regulatory subunit dimer, you've got a type 2 protein kinase A enzyme. And I told you at the time that type 1 protein kinase A's are usually free and soluble in the cytoplasm, okay? So usually they're just floating around in the cytoplasm. Whereas I told you type 2 protein kinase A's, they are usually attached to um, certain subcellular locations, okay? So they usually have an attachment to maybe an intracellular membrane or the cytosolic face of the plasma membrane, etc. And the main reason for this is that type 2 protein kinase A's are much better at binding to A caps than type 1 protein kinase A's. So most A caps bind type 2 protein kinase A's to their protein kinase A binding domain. A few bind type 1 protein kinase A's to their protein kinase A binding domain. Okay, and some A caps bind both type 1 and type 2.
Okay, right. So now what I want to discuss is the actual interaction between uh, the A kinase anchoring protein and the um, regulatory subunit dimer of protein kinase A. Okay, so I want to see how can the protein kinase A enzyme in the inactive state and also in the active state note. Okay, so remember, even when it's being activated, the regulatory subunit dimer remains intact, and the regulatory subunit dimer will remain attached to the A cap. Okay, so let's firstly just remind ourselves of the structure of a protein kinase A uh, inactive tetramer. Okay, so. Uh, if you remember, he, I'll start by drawing a single regulatory subunit of protein kinase A. Here's the dimerization slash docking domain. Here is the linker. Okay, here are the cyclic nucleotide binding domains. The cyclic nucleotide binding domain A followed by the cyclic nucleotide binding domain B. Okay, and now I'll draw another regulatory subunit dimerized here. Okay, again with this dimerization and docking domain. Here is the linker. And here is the cyclic nucleotide binding domains, like so, and here's the C-terminus. Then, remember, attached into this sort of region here, we then have the catalytic subunits of protein kinase A here. Okay, right, so let's colour this all in. So we've got the dimerization slash docking domains here in orange. Okay, we've got these linker regions here in green like so. We've got the catalytic subunit of protein kinase A here in vivid purple. Okay, and then we've got the cyclic nucleotide binding domains which we'll have here in blue. Okay, and remember in the inactive state it's, um, it's got the protein kinase A catalytic subunits bound, but in the active state when you've got cyclic AMP bound to these uh, cyclic nucleotide binding domains, all that's different is that the catalytic subunits have been released from the regulatory subunit dimer, okay? And in fact, the regulatory subunit dimer can remain bound to the A cap even once it's released the catalytic subunits. And that's really because the A cap's going to bind to the uh, protein kinase A through these dimerization and docking domains. So now you understand why it's called a dimerization and docking domain. The dimerization is obvious, that's always been obvious. The docking is because it's going to dock these things at um, A caps, basically. Okay, so the A caps are going to bind to the protein kinase A uh, tetramers via these dimerization slash docking domains. And of course, this is far, far away from where the conformational changes occur that release the catalytic subunits. So the binding to the A cap is going to be unaffected by uh, the activation of the enzyme, basically. The regulatory subunit dimer will remain bound to the A cap uh, even when it's got cyclic AMP bound to its cyclic nucleotide binding domains. Okay, now I want to discuss the interaction between the protein kinase A binding domains of A caps and the dimerization and docking domains in a little bit more detail because something quite interesting is known, which is the fact that all the A caps that we have found all contain a structure called an amphipathic helix, which seems to be absolutely essential for binding to uh, the dimerized, dimerization slash docking domains. Okay, so let me draw this amphipathic helix. In fact, I'll put it on here. Okay, so here there is a helix in this protein kinase A binding domain here. And it's a helix with five turns. So I've drawn one, two, three, four, five turns there. Okay, and it's quite a short helix. It's only around uh, 14 to 18 amino acids. Okay, so 14 to 18 amino acid residues. And it has this property of being amphipathic, basically. Okay, now what does amphipathic mean? Well, basically it means that you have both hydrophobic portions, okay, portions that don't interact well with water at all and interact very well with lipid molecules, and then you also have charged portions, okay, and in fact this amphipathic helix is uh, very extreme. On one side of the helix it has hydrophobic uh, molecules or hydrophobic residues, so let's say on this purple side of the helix, 
it's going to have lots of hydrophobic residues, so loads of big clunky residues that don't have any sort of polar bonds, all the bonds are neutral, okay, that's the hydrophobic sort of residue, so this is the hydrophobic residue side, okay, and on the other side you have the complete opposite. Okay, on the other side of the helix, you have charged residues. Okay, the complete opposite. They interact with water fantastically. They're better than water. Water's just partial charges. These are really charged. Okay, so these are charged residues. Okay, right, so that's what I mean by an amphipathic helix. Okay, one side has these hydrophobic residues, the other side has the charged residues. And it's the hydrophobic residue side that's going to actually interact with this dimerized dimerization and docking domains. Okay, so let me now show you the dimerization and docking domains of these protein kinase A uh, regulatory subunit dimers in more detail. Okay, so. Um, let's start by showing the one on uh, this side here. Okay, so, in actual fact, what I've drawn you here is an oversimplified picture because actually the amino terminus of this one here ends up being on this side and the amino terminus of this one ends up being on that side as part of the way in which they're entangled together to dimerize. So, I'm going to start by showing the dimerization and docking domain of this one here, but the amino terminus is going to be on the opposite side, basically. Okay, so what happens is you have a motif that is called a helix turn helix motif, which consists of two helices separated by a little linker, which is the turn. Okay, so here is one helix, and then it will turn, and then you'll have another helix, which I'm going to have going into the plane away from us. So this is a helix that is in this sort of axis here. Okay, and then that will go off, and then you've got the rest of it coming down here. Okay, so this is now going into this linker. Okay, so to highlight this up, this is the beginning of the linker here. All of this in orange here is the dimerization slash docking domain. Okay. And it consists of this helix turn helix motif, which just means you've got a helix followed by a turn followed by another helix. Okay, so this is described as a helix. Okay, that's the first helix. Then you've got a turn. That's this portion here. And then you've got another helix down here. So it's a helix turn helix motif followed by the linker. Okay, then to show the other uh, dimerization and docking domain of the other uh, regulatory subunit of protein kinase A, its end terminus will be on the opposite side over here. Okay, then its alpha helix will be intertwined with this one here. Okay, like so. And then it will have its turn coming down like this, and then it will have a helix here. Okay, going into the page, and then it will go down into the linker like so. Okay, right, so basically the amphipathic helix of uh, the ACAP protein is believed to bind to this portion of the dimerized dimerization and docking domain. So I'll just finish colouring in uh, this dimerization and docking domain in orange here, and then the linker down here is in green. Right, okay, so this portion here is where the amphipathic uh, helix, specifically the hydrophobic side of the amphipathic helix, is going to bind. Okay, so this is what's known as the ACAP binding motif. Okay, now what I've actually drawn you here is a type 2 protein kinase A regulatory subunit dimer. Okay, uh, and the reason I can tell you that is because the end terminus of a type 1 protein kinase A regulatory subunit dimer, dimerization and docking domain, contains actually another alpha helix here, and it's believed to be that additional alpha helix that makes it more difficult for the amphipathic helices of A caps to actually bind to this portion here. Okay, right. Uh, so we'll call it there for this video and we'll continue this discussion in the next video.